for you. That was a hectic few months. Right, we're back. Welcome back to Kagito Design, the video series where we talk about all things tabletop. Now, is there anything more tasty than a victory point? These delicious, amorphous units of winningness permeate across all kinds of games. From fantasy dungeon crawlers to vast futuristic sci-fi universes. In the realm of board games, victory points are the ultimate arbiters of them all. Coronating the victors and sentencing the losers, victory points are the all-knowing judge that decides the fate of all tabletop gamers. But is there a better way? This video is all about endings. Endings are a universal element. They apply to all board games, with the possible exception of Monopoly. And yet, getting them right can be a challenge. In this video, I'm going to look at some of the best endings in the hobby and discuss the do's and don'ts of ending games. In 2018, author Scott Westerfeld gave a really interesting talk at the Shucks board game convention in Vancouver, with the title, Victory Points Suck. His argument was persuasive. Great ball games will tell great stories, and great stories have great endings. Unfortunately, the inherent boring bureaucracy entailed in totting up victory points will never make for a great ending. He gives the example of Freytag's Pyramid, a system for dramatic structure explained by Gustav Freytag in 1863. In this narrative structure, we have some characters and a scene introduced. Some conflict is then injected into this scenario. The tension builds to a climax and we finish with a resolution. It is by no means the only way to structure a successful story, but it is a familiar and well-used model. Westerfeld points out that the tale of a modern board game looks a little more like this. The climax, the great moment the whole story was leading up to, is stolen away and replaced by anemic accountancy. For Westerfeld, games are better when they keep the climax. They are better when they have a simple and thematic victory condition. He gives the example of a boss fight, or of characters racing to be the first person on Mars. A single, recognisable objective that is hard to achieve, but symbolises the pinnacle of the game in the end of the story. There are many games that do this. Chess, for example, ends the turn before a player will take their opponent's king. In Pandemic, players work together to cure four deadly contagions that have spread around the world. And there's something to this. In Pandemic, you play as a team trying to do exactly this, cure four diseases. It could easily be changed. You could gain a point every time you clear a disease cube. You could lose points for causing outbreaks or running out of cubes. After a few epidemic cards are drawn, you could then tot up the points and see if you hit the minimum needed to win the game. It would work, but it would no longer tell the story. So, is Westerfeld correct then? Should we consign victory points to the dustbin of tabletop history? I'm not so sure. Whilst I do love a game with exciting victory conditions, many, indeed perhaps most of my favourite games use victory points. Is this just a flaw in a series of otherwise excellent games? Or is there something that the humble victory point still has to offer? So let's dive deeper. The first potential issue with a single victory condition is that it could feasibly lead to games becoming predictable and repetitive. The homogenous nature of victory points allows them to be assigned to all sorts of completely different activities. This gives designers the freedom to have multiple paths to victory that may be completely different from each other. The fun and fungible victory point can be assigned to both allow players the agency to choose which path they want to follow, and, importantly, leaving open other paths to explore in future games. That being said, victory conditions do not have to be singular. My number one game of all time is Inish, a game which tells incredible emergent stories as you play and ends when one of three potential victory conditions are met. You could dominate over opposing clans, spread out and explore the island, or place your clans in areas where sanctuaries have been built. 
All are very different approaches requiring different cards and strategies. Each feels like a unique end to the narrative of the game, and even eight years on from its release, I'm still getting the game to the table. Similarly, Scythe by Stonemaier Games has nine possible ways to gain stars. These varied objectives can be anything from building mechs to increasing your popularity amongst the citizens of Europa. Each gains you a star and the first to six ends the game. But it doesn't end there. Your stars are converted to money. Your territory is converted to money. Your resources are converted to money. And how much you get for each is dictated by your popularity meter. So the winner is the player with the most money. It sounds very much like victory points to me. Scythe was so close to creating a pure victory condition game. Indeed, had they ended it by the first to achieve six stars, it pretty much would be. Why then add the extra accountancy step? Is this just more bureaucracy or is there something added by this approach? I think there is. Whilst there may indeed be something a little narrative breaking about the totting up of victory points, even if we call them by another name, there are huge benefits to this approach and reasons why designers keep returning to them. First, they are an excellent way to limit randomness in games. Now, this is not necessarily a positive thing, and there are different flavours of randomness I have discussed in previous videos, but many modern board gamers prefer to keep random outcomes to a minimum. They want to win a game using their own skill and efficient gameplay, not be robbed by a victory by the fickle hand of fate. This is not the opinion of all gamers, of course, and perhaps we see a reason for Westerfeld's conclusion here. Early on in the speech, he gives the example of a war game he played in his youth that stuck in his memory due to its excellence. After over 40 hours of play, the entire game rested on the roll of a die. Anything but one would win the allies the game. He of course rolled a one, sending the world spiralling into a fascist dystopia. For Westerfeld, this provided a great narrative experience. For many modern Euro gamers, well, you don't need to go far on BGG to find out what they think of this. So, victory points give you player agency. That's true, but there are other benefits to this substitutable scoring system. As victory points are amorphous and can be applied anywhere to anything, this can be a great help when balancing a game. Another great desire of the modern Euro gamer. Two completely different paths to victory can be perfectly balanced by simply adding or reducing the number of points it gains you for following it, thus creating games where all paths are equal and no one single clear winning strategy can emerge. As victory points can be peppered in a perfectly balanced way throughout the game, they are incredibly good at rewarding a player at all stages of play, rather than just at the very end. Your strategy and efficiency in play will always be rewarded, and whilst this may limit the excitement of the end of the game in the accounting stage, it increases your engagement in the early and middle game. A victory condition can only be achieved once, but victory points can be gained from your very first turn. Again, this may not be everyone's cup of tea. Apparently, not all people like to spend their weekend evenings carefully plotting the most efficient strategy for building trade routes throughout the Roman Empire. I don't understand why, but apparently they don't. But if, like me, that sounds like the perfect Saturday evening, then victory points will help get you there. Victory points are also great for pointing players in the direction the designers want them to take. In Viticulture, for example, there are big piles of points available for fulfilling wine contracts. This is clearly listed in the cards themselves, making them a tasty carrot dangled out for players to reach for, and thus subtly guiding them to play the game as the designer intended. Even the endgame accountancy phase has a place. A very popular approach to modern game design is the point salad, creating a complex game with multiple paths to victory where everything you do can gain you points, and there are seemingly endless numbers of ways to score. Aside from the aforementioned variety this approach brings, it also has a secondary benefit. It keeps the winner hidden until the very end of the game. Games with victory conditions or basic score tracker systems can sometimes suffer from the runaway leader issue. 
It can become obvious who is going to win a game long before the game is actually over, making the final stages a complete drag. Having complexity, multiple paths to victory, and even hidden point scoring systems can keep the knowledge of who will ultimately be victorious hidden until the very end. This keeps the game exciting and even makes the scoring itself an exciting moment of revelation. I think this may be part of the reason for Scythe adding this extra scoring element at the end. You may be able to predict in advance who will get their 6th star token first, but that doesn't mean you know who has won the game. Or take the example of Great Western Trail. At the end of this game, you'll score from 11 different potential paths to victory. With scores often adding up to over 100, it is very hard, if not impossible, to keep track of how many points your opponents are scoring, so who played the game the best is only revealed at the very end. Often with nearly all players feeling like they could have won. So should we remove victory points from all games and instead focus only on rich narrative victory conditions? I don't think so. Whilst it is probably true that more games should go down this approach than currently do, there is still very much a place for victory points in our hobby. These endlessly fungible droplets of pure victory will, I believe, still be with us for many more years to come, and I for one will be drinking in as many as I can. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to show your support. I'll be back soon. Bye.